going to talk about spectrum. Uh, spectrum is not normally something that uh, we worry about in, uh, in the property tax world, um, but uh, I am starting to see more and more interest in it. And so uh, part of my work and, and uh, willingness to uh, uh, offer some insights here at, at this conference, I decided to put something together on the pricing. Um, point out that uh, this is technically an ongoing series. Uh, what I've been doing for the past couple of years, either at TFI or at Wichita, uh, is to present about what I'm seeing on the Spectrum results. Uh, the first one that I did uh, was here about four years ago. Um, I did an analysis of auction uh, 73, which was a 700 megahertz auction. Uh, part two, I followed up about six months later, and we did an analysis of auction 96. Uh, that is uh, otherwise known as the H block. That's the one that uh, Dish uh, ended up winning. Uh, so this particular discussion is going to focus on two more auctions that took place subsequent to those dates. Uh, auction 97, which was uh, what's known as mid-band, uh, that's also uh, referred to as the AWS-3 band, and that took place in January 2015. Uh, AT&T won that one. Uh, auction 1002, this is the incentive auction, uh, the 600 megahertz auction that just wrapped up a few months ago. Um, that was the low band spectrum, and the top bidder on that one was T-Mobile. To highlight some takeaways that we had from those previous sessions, um, what I ended up really pointing out was just the simplistic nature of how spectrum works. Um, because lower band spectrum uh, can go farther, it can propagate more, um, it's got better penetration in building, and uh, with licensed spectrum, there's some exclusivity, so there's no worry about interference. But uh, because of that, historically, carriers have relied on it uh, to help maximize their coverage. Uh, hence, the value in what you see for uh, spectrum. Um, because the low band had those best qualities, they subsequently got referred to as beachfront spectrum. Uh, they were thereby seen as the most valuable uh, relative to mid-band and relative to high band. And, and I'll, uh, I'll stop here because I want to talk about the value that people uh, historically use to determine uh, uh, how to measure spectrum against one another. And that's based off of a metric called uh, price per pop megahertz or price per megahertz pop. And to give you a very simple example, let's say that you buy a spectrum uh, license in a certain area for $10 million. So that's the price you paid $10 million. Uh, on the denominator, it's pop megahertz. So pop is population, uh, and megahertz is the width of the spectrum that you're buying. So for example, if you spent 10 million bucks and you got a slice of spectrum between 700 megahertz and 710 megahertz, the megahertz there in that denominator is 10. So you bought 10. And pop is population. And so let's say for this spectrum purchase uh, you bought, it covers a million people. So on the numerator, you have 10 million. On the denominator, you have 1 million and then 10. 1 million times 10 is 10 million. So $10 million divided by 10 million pop megahertz is $1. That's the, that's the nature. And so you go higher, you go lower, and it all starts with that. Uh, and from here on out, I'll just refer to uh, the spectrum prices in terms of pop megahertz or megahertz pop. The anecdotal relationship that Beachfront property being the most valuable spectrum and then everything going on down, that's anecdotally supported for a long time, even by uh, recent auctions, especially by recent auctions. Uh, if you looked at the ones that we did the analysis for uh, a few years back, you start with the, mid, the, the low band spectrum here, the auction 73. Uh, the average, weighted average price for the uh, spectrum that got sold that day in the auction was $1.29. Um, and then you uh, jump down here, you have the AWS auction, and then you also have the H block auction. Those sold for 54 cents and, and 50 cents, respectively, total. And if you graph them on a line with frequency at the bottom and price per pop megahertz uh, on the side, you get this beautiful red line, nice and smooth. It totally validates everything that we've seen uh, so far, supporting that you know, uh, beachfront is still valuable. And the stuff that's, you know, uh, that, that's less valuable is the mid-band and the high-band. So that was the takeaway. What didn't get discussed at those meetings was, in particular, what about the older auctions? You know, you go back to the auctions that uh, have taken place 
uh, in the United States. And we're focusing on the US here. Um, there have been over 80 auctions um, since the start of time. So we have quite a bit of information about what people are paying for these particular licenses and the properties of each one. We also have those newer auctions. We have the auction 97 and the uh, auction 1002, which I wanted to incorporate into this analysis. So what I decided to do is I pulled together all the information. All this information is available on the FCC website. It's compiled and formatted in um, other databases by uh, other groups, including there's a Penn State uh, database, which uh, maintains some uh, really good information about some of the older auctions. So I pulled together every auction I could find that the total aggregate bids were greater than $100 million. Uh, there's 24 of those. Uh, those are listed here. I've got them all listed out by the auction number, the name, what date it took place, the average frequency, um, the qualified bidders. Obviously, there's going to be bidders, uh, more or fewer bidders based on what's going on. We'll discuss that a little bit more. Uh, the weighted average bandwidth, how much was being sold uh, um, on a weighted average basis in that particular auction. And then the uh, overall dollar per pop megahertz. Uh, and then to compare uh, these different prices over time, I decided to incorporate an inflation adjustment. So uh, all the older auctions uh, are getting inflated uh, with, with positive trends, uh, just going along with uh, US inflation. And then I graphed them. So the first thing that you'll notice is over here, I've got the low band. Uh, over here, I've got the mid-band auctions, and over here, I've got the high-band auctions. Now, you'll also notice that this is a logarithmic scale, so it's no longer uh, you know, the, uh, the linear uh, um, steps that you see over here. If you took all of the low bands and all the mid-bands and all the high bands uh, and you plotted them, you get that red line right there. So there is a relationship that you can see that is um, you know, still more or less uh, pointing towards value being in the high and the, in the low band, first of all. Now, you will also could do this by taking all the low bands and averaging them together, and then taking all the mid bands and averaging them together, and the high bands and averaging them together, and you see them on those X's. And those X's, it's you know, quite uh, impressive. They actually fall on that line that you're seeing. So here's the problem. Uh, the problem is, if you know anything about statistics, uh, you know that this R squared here tells us that this is not a very good fit. Uh, R squared is, in statistics, tells you if, you have, if it's a one, it's a perfect fit. If it's zero, uh, it's a terrible fit. So an R squared of 10% is rather weak. Uh, and you can understand why. Take a look at those outliers. You know, for starters, on the low band, you have two very, very old auctions. In fact, auction one and auction three are right up there at the top. And you have that, those guys have to be forgiven. I mean, there's no prior market for, for you know, those types of auctions. So they're really bidding with no uh, sense of, you know, what their limit is or, or, you know, where the possibilities are for spectrum. It's a whole new world. Uh, conversely, take a look in the mid-band. Uh, the mid-band had been suffering a little bit. These recent auctions that you see popping up here, I'll just take you through one by one. Uh, this is absolutely an effect of the dot-com uh, um, bubble that was taking place at the time. Uh, this is auction five. Uh, you had 255 bidders in this auction. Uh, this is an unbelievable number. In fact, it's the highest auction uh, count for bidders that's ever taken place uh, and still is the record. Uh, half of it was won by a company called NextWave, uh, and then uh, a little bit more from BDPCS. BDPCS eventually defaulted uh, on the licenses that they bid on. Uh, a couple months later, they decided to have another auction for the uh, um, for the spectrum that was defaulted by BDPCS. That was auction 10. They had a, instituted a rule for it was to be a small business auction only. In other words, they shut out incumbents entirely and decided, we just want small businesses to come in here. Well, the problem was that the small businesses were all well-funded with venture capital. And they, in turn, bid up the price for those defaulted auctions. And it turns out 70% of those defaulted licenses were then acquired by NextWave. NextWave eventually ran out of cash and defaulted and declared bankruptcy. <laughs> so obviously there is a bidder with some dumb money going through and, and uh, you know, going in with unrealistic expectations about cash flow, uh, turning that price over on its head. Um, that auction 35 that took place, that's uh, a few years after. That's the defaulted licenses that NextWave um, had, uh, uh, had bid on. 
and the FCC had taken them back. Uh, it had turned out the telecom providers uh, um, enormously bid up those prices, but eventually NextWave took those uh, uh, licenses back. Uh, that was the Supreme Court decision where uh, it had ramifications on Chapter 13 uh, um, or Chapter 11 uh, bankruptcy laws. But uh, that's not what I want to talk about. That's a whole different story. What I wanted to talk about were the two most recent auctions. What you see here, auction 97, this is the H block licenses, uh, January in 2015. Uh, you know, actually, that is, should have been the, uh, that's a typo. That should actually say the AWS 3 auction. Uh, that took place in January 2015. That was your pop megahertz, uh, the dollar per pop megahertz, well above that line. And then fast forward to auction 1002, that's the uh, incentive auction that took place a few months ago. That is where the dollar per pop megahertz. Uh, came up. So very clearly, we are seeing more and more outliers to this, you know, supposed rule about beachfront being the best and uh, it being less valuable as you go along. So what's going on there? Well, I want to take you through the timeline of what exactly happened so you can understand how we got to this point. Uh, and, and I think you'll find this pretty interesting. So let's take you back to this beautiful red line, the frontier, based on the past three auctions that have shown, you know, exactly what we've seen historically. I'll pull those out uh, so you can see a little better. For starters, the January 2015 AWS 3 auction, uh, 97, uh, the FCC had based a reserve price of $10 million on that bid, on the, on, the, on the overall auction. They said, okay, we're gonna raise $10 million. And if you took $10 million and you figured out how much of the pop megahertz was being sold, that number comes out to 49 cents. And check it out, I mean, that number is right there on the frontier line, so clearly, their analysis is just reinforcing this. This is what's happened in prior auctions, so this is what we expect is going to happen for this auction. Well, that's not what would really happen at all. In fact, the price quadrupled. The price for the AWS 3 um, spectrum went for $2.03 per, per pop megahertz, and an unreal number uh, blew everybody's expectations about what that spectrum, or at least what they thought that spectrum was worth. And then we fast forward to the incentive auction. The incentive auction was being um, praised as an extravaganza. There was going to be you know, an enormous amount of money that was to be come, come rolling in for the FCC. There were a lot of lofty expectations about how much uh, in, in, in money that was going to bring in. And uh, I like to highlight what Moody's had uh, thrown out there. Uh, they're one of the few that, uh, that would dare to estimate just how much or forecast how much would be coming in. Uh, Moody's anticipated $60 billion in total value coming in. And if you took the amount of spectrum that was available and you figured out on the pop megahertz basis, that comes out to $2.82. And you can almost see what Moody's was thinking. You know, if you took a look at this line right here, and Moody's estimation was spectrum is more valuable. You know, we are seeing it now in the most recent auctions. A rising tide lifts all boats. And all, they, all that I suspect they did is they just took this line here and they moved it up. They just moved it up and said, oh, look, okay, well, look, the mid-band is worth this. High-band's got to be worth more. Let's just graph it and move it up. Well, that's not what happened at all. Um, quite the opposite. You know, the incentive auction came in about 91 cents per pop megahertz. So it was relatively disappointing um, insofar as the... Uh, uh, the expectations were concerned. Um, they still did bring in some money. It wasn't considered a failure, uh, you know, according to some analysts, according to some FCC folks. Uh, but certainly, this is not what people were expecting. So bigger picture, I mean, let's talk about what's happening here. Um, for starters, it's clear that every auction just appears to stand alone to some respect, that there are different conditions, different situations going on within that auction. Um, the incumbents and the participants, you've got a lot of people that are either don't know what they're doing or they're going in with crazy expectations. Uh, you have different rules. The FCC may say, oh, no, we're just going to have small business people only, or you know, we're going to have this very convoluted incentive auction where you have to bid and you have to really understand it. I don't know if any of you have ever looked at the rules for the incentive auction if you wanted to bid, but you know, it, if you wanted to print it out, it's probably about that thick. Uh, and, I tried to get through it and try to figure it out, and I think my eyes started bleeding. It's, it's really hard, and it's really complicated to understand. And, and who knows why they decided to do this. I think conceptually they thought, you know, everybody's going to win, we're going to come up with a system, and, and, and things are going to be great. 
uh, you know, perhaps the complexity of it is what ended up contributing to it. It's about a downfall that there weren't many people bidding on it, but uh, we'll get to that too. Um, also, we have to consider, you know, those auctions are a function of what's going on at the time. That people are using Spectrum and the carriers are expecting to use Spectrum in a certain way based off what's going on at that point in time. Uh, you also have, you know, there's an evolving effectiveness of what carriers think they can do with that spectrum. So whether or not, you know, they can use this for uh, uh, more, more data focused or more capacity focused, there is certainly uh, what appears to be a trend going on here. And I think that's what's going on here in this case. I think what we're seeing with auction 97 and auction 1002, I think it's a wake-up call. I think we're seeing that mid-band is starting to see some premium getting applied to it. Uh, mid-band has what's known as kind of a happy medium. It's kind of good coverage for getting through buildings, and it's kind of good for, um, you know, uh, adding capacity to existing locations. So, you know, it's not one or it's the other, but uh, it's, it's pretty good for both. You know, the, uh, the, this line here I love because it's definitely something an engineer would write. Low band helps for coverage, but as cells densify for capacity sake, propagation containment is problematic. Uh, <laughs> that's just in a way to think about it. If you have like a bunch of high powered cells and they're just standing next to each other and they're blasting each other, there's no way you can get good uh, containment of those fields. You're, you're not gonna be uh, getting a very good signal to noise ratio. Uh, they're all going to be comp colliding and competing with each other. I think mid-band probably provides a superior uh, product in that sense. A lot of people missed that memo uh, on the, on the uh, determination of where they were going on the 600 and the expectations. The FCC thought one thing, and Moody's definitely thought something else. So how do we know for sure? I think you know, it's easy to just look at those charts and say, okay, it's up here, and, and uh, you know, mid-band is down here. Mid-band is up here and low bands down here, and so now the game is flipped. But I wanted to check and make sure, uh, I think the best way that I could identify uh, to do that was to take a look at the other factors going on within the auctions. Obviously this auction is not you know, one single number getting thrown out there. It's a series of bids going on on individual licenses across the world. And because of that, you're, the, the carriers are bidding on specific markets, and those markets have properties. Properties like age, income, density, all those conditions uh, go into what buyers would be looking for uh, when they're trying to purchase auction uh, spectrum. There's also characteristics of the bands. Sometimes the bands are easier to deploy and sometimes they're a little bit more difficult. So what I decided to do is I wanted to run a regression on both of those. And you know, why would I do that? Well, for starters, you know, I needed some time to fill for this presentation. Uh, more importantly, I was really curious. I wanted to know, you know, how do you build up to that uh, dollar per pop megahertz for any given area? Uh, what are the factors that are going in? And I'm, you know, just to think about it kind of anecdotally, you know, you could say it's 20 cents for this and 40 cents for this. And basically you'd find a way to build up to the price for that given area. So I took a look at the information within the auctions and they give you a lot of good information about, you know, um, uh, that particular market. And from there you can actually extract it and pull in uh, different information from the census. Uh, census you know, information is quite readily available, and I used, ended up using 2010 uh, census information. Uh, and to normalize it, you're using a market percentile. So, you know, whatever it is, that particular area uh, in, in the overall uh, market percentile, it's either like, you know, 1% or 99%. Uh, and that helps just for statistical purposes. Um, and then I also included the characteristics of the uh, particular um, license that was being auctioned, whether it was a paired, whether it was a low band or mid band, uh, and then actually the width. Um, that was something I was curious about too, about whether or not, you know, if someone's spending more for the 12 megahertz bandwidth than they are for the 10 megahertz bandwidth. Um, so that's something I looked at. And I want to focus, I mean, this is really what I'm trying to do is figure out what happened before with the prior auctions that I looked at, and then that's going to be auctions 66 and 73. Um, and then We'll take a look at what happened after those auctions. So that includes auctions 97 and 1002. So we're kind of turning them into buckets. We have a before and then we have an after. And you'll see the number of spectrum licenses that you can look at is quite high. I mean, there were over 2,000 licenses in that before bucket, and there's over 4,000 licenses on the after bucket. Uh, so quite a uh, meaningful amount of data that you can explore. 
Uh, the regression results are here. I am not going to go through this, but I want to point out one thing. Um, this is on the before. This is auction 66 and 73 when things were looking normal. Uh, the, the statistics that we look at here are uh, focused on multiple R. Multiple R, when you're doing a multivariable regression, uh, is really what you're focused on. Uh, and that tells you we're 68%. So I've got a 68-70% uh, uh, confidence level uh, on that. And I, I think uh, there's certainly, it, there, there could be room for improvement, but I think this is pretty good for what we're trying to do here. Uh, that's on the before, and then that's on the after, similar numbers. I got about 70%. So let me show you the equations that are basically uh, contributing to these factors. And then you can really see what's going on. Um, for starters, you do this regression, you figure out, okay, this isn't a meaningful statistic, let's drop it. Or this is a very meaningful statistic, and let's find out what the weightings are. What I found was that there were five uh, statistically significant variables based off of what I had seen. Um, the first one is going to be median income percentile. This is no surprise uh, because when you're buying for spectrum in a market, you want to go after wealthier people. You want to go after affluent uh, population. The more money they have, uh, the more disposable <laughs> income they'll have to uh, purchase and potentially become customers. Uh, so these are the kind of customers you like. Uh, we have, um, you know, just as a note, the minimum median income in the U.S. is 11300 Does anybody know where that is? That's in Puerto Rico. There's some very, very poor areas uh, in, in the middle of Puerto Rico, and that would be one of them. Does anybody know where the maximum median income is? Yeah. Loudoun County, uh, Virginia, just outside of D.C. $125,000. That's good work if you can get it. So you have this before and after here. I've got the before. Uh, what, what's going on is here, I've got this 55 cent uh, coefficient uh, times the median income percentile. So based off of whatever um, uh, percentile they're in, you're capturing as much as that 55, 55 cents as possible. So that Loudoun County, Virginia is getting almost all of that 55 uh, cent. Conversely, uh, areas in Puerto Rico are getting almost none of that. Uh, on the after, uh, you're seeing 31 cents. Now, you know, that looks like quite a drop, I think. Uh, there can be a lot of factors that are going in here, which we're just not modeling. But I think it's just important to note that, you know, there is a weighting that's being considered for more uh, affluent areas, 55 versus 31. Uh, it's certainly interesting uh, to, to point that out. And I don't have answers about what's causing it. But, um, you know, it is a positive factor. The second one is going to be median age. Uh, the minimum uh, within those areas is 21 and a half. Uh, anybody know where that is? Uh, it's actually a, a, another county in Virginia. I don't know what's going on in Virginia. They have the youngest, you know. This is not Loudoun County, though, I mean, obviously. Uh, maximum 66 years, I think you can guess where that is. Sumter County, Florida. Clearly, you can see what's going on here. You have a minus 35 cents. And what's, why? Because the carriers don't want to deal with old people. You know, they want their young crowd, they want the technologically uh, savvy folks, uh, you know, who want to buy their products. And so they're more predisposed uh, to younger people or to younger uh, markets, uh, whatever that median age is percentile. So uh, poor Sumter County, Florida is getting 35 cents, almost 35 cents taken away from their pop megahertz uh, uh, dollar amount. And then on the after, you've got 31 cents being taken away. So very, very similar. Uh, you know, uh, it appears that there is no impact going on. There's no uh, change uh, in, in perception. They are still not placing any emphasis on age. In fact, they're, you know, it's quite the opposite. Uh, the third one was really interesting to me um, is the pairing. So whether or not the frequency that you're buying is paired. Uh, you know, I have it as a zero or a one if it's no or yes. And what it turns out is that on the before, as you can probably imagine, uh, if the pairing existed, then you add 49 cents. But on the after, you're still placing value in that paired asset, in the, in, the, in the paired spectrum, which is a little surprising to me. I mean, I think going forward, based off of everything we've heard about, uh, we know that the, the downlink is quite, uh, you know, the, the much more valuable property that's being considered. So why would you want to bother spending more money on the paired offering uh, when, you know, really the future of this 
uh, uh, network is going to be on an unpaired basis where there's going to be some a little bit more asynchronous use towards the downlink. So there's still some anarchic, uh, you know, archaic uh, um, uh, numbers being applied here that they're still looking at uh, these particular characteristics. Oh, uh, well, paired being um, you have, you know, if you're selling 10 megahertz, you're supposed to uh, bifurcate those. You have 5 megahertz, which is dedicated to just broadcasting down uh, to the device. And then you have 5 megahertz uh, set aside for the uplink. So stuff going from the user out to uh, the, the base, the base uh, um, uh, station. It used to be it was all synchronous because, you know, people are talking. There's a lot of two-way conversations going on, so obviously you don't need, uh, you know, something a little bit bigger on one side and smaller on the other. And so, uh, why are we still worried about that? That's, you know, that's a really good question. I don't know why we're still doing that. Uh, the one that I really wanted to point out and really uh, drives home what's going on here is that mid-band property. Uh, what we've seen is the mid-band. And I really just assign it a zero one. So if it's mid, if it's mid band, it's you know if it's between this one thousand and twenty one megahertz, it's a one. If uh, if not, it's a zero. On the before on the auctions nine uh, sixty six and seventy three, what we see, what we did see, is that if it was mid band, there was inherently a, a disadvantage and really heavy penalty uh, that was getting pulled out of that amount. And so uh, as much as seventy six cents uh, on the before. On the after, we saw just the opposite, that there is actually a premium getting applied on that mid-band spectrum. So you have a swing of a dollar from 76 cents penalty to 38 cents penalty. Uh, that's, that's really telling, and that's giving the bigger picture that it's, you know, we know that there's a shift that took place on the overall, but on the individual markets, we're seeing it there. The last one, too, I think is also interesting to point out. There is a density factor uh, percentile, and the minimum is obviously a place like Yukon where there's you know, nothing there, maximum being New York City. On the before, they are applying a, um, a premium based off of density uh, of, of about 45 cents. On the after, we did not see that density factor profile. That was not a very st statistically significant variable. So what that tells me is that that mid-band uh, premium that's getting applied there is indirectly uh, capturing the value of having density uh, within a market. So you're paying for mid-band for a reason, and that is to be in the dense markets. And it's also, you know, to some extent to have some uh, coverage um, in places where you may not have had it before. But it's also flexible enough that you can add capacity. That is really my takeaway, is that the carrier's uses of the low band versus the mid band have evolved. I think we are now seeing a mid band priced as a premium product. Uh, in other words, I think what we're seeing is this. We're not seeing you know, the straight decline. I think we're seeing the end of this being beachfront as far as we're concerned. And why is that? Well, you know, obviously the flexibility that we've talked about in the past uh, is, is certainly there. I think more uh, importantly is that we're focused now in today's market on extending capacity. For a long time, it was all about coverage. We got to get everything covered. We got to cover everything. We got to buy you know, all the markets. We got to blast these big radios. In there. So now, as you're adding coverage and you've maximized your coverage, you now need to start working on scaling up and getting more of the ability to put more stuff into your existing customers. And your mid band does that very well. In fact, there's good evidence. Um, the, the small cell networks and the DAS networks out there. Um, that are being operated by carriers, uh, well, not carriers, but they're being operated by uh, companies like Crown Castle. Uh, and what they are offering is a mid-band product. They very rarely offer, they very rarely will offer a low-band product. They very rarely will broadcast those 700 megahertz spectrums because they know what the carriers want. The carriers want to get mid-band, and so they're selling what the carriers want. I don't know if this curve is inverted permanently. Uh, I don't know where this direction is going. I think a big question mark is the high band stuff. Uh, I have not looked at this analysis yet on the high band, and I hope to do that eventually. Um, but what I, you know, I like to ask this question just as far as uh, you know, curiosity. I think this is really hypothetical at this point that we talk about. But what would it take for the existing uh, holdings by carriers 
to be repriced. I mean, you have these, um, these, these, uh, these licenses that you've purchased, and as a carrier is sitting on it, uh, you know, are you revaluing those? Are you considering the beachfront property that you used to think was valuable less valuable? Uh, and if so, are you going to, you know, uh, perform some sort of impairment on it? Uh, you know, I'll answer that one, and I don't think so. I don't think it's likely just because uh, Spectrum tends to be valued as a whole. Um, you're not slicing up individual markets, and you're not slicing up uh, individual band types. So uh, I, I don't think uh, that's really how uh, the auditors would go about thinking of it. More, and, and also, you think about more hypothetical. Um, the Jefferson Pilot Method, the Jefferson Pilot Method was uh, considered uh, kind of the classical way to figure out how much uh, your spectrum was worth. The idea is that you, you know, construct a hypothetical network and you acquire customers and whatever the net present value is of that development of the network is the spectrum value. Well, in a hypothetical scenario like that, would a hypothetical carrier first build out coverage to cover everybody? Uh, and then work on capacity after that? Would there be phases? Uh, you know, it, those are really interesting questions, and, and I think ones that would have to be addressed if you were starting to consider a uh, different value of spectrum as opposed to, uh, you know, spectrum as a whole. Uh, and then also there's, you know, the issue of the, the recent private uh, uh, transactions that have taken place on spectrum. Uh, I got a hold of some spectrum prices that uh, uh, they were actually performed by uh, Goldman Sachs using some information from uh, uh, AllNet uh, Insights, which uh, CostQuest uses. A um, president by the name of uh, Brian Gemmer uh, provided me some of this information. And what it's showing is that the, uh, the market transactions that are taking place out there between uh, individual buyers and sellers uh, outside of the FCC auctions are still showing that linear decline. Uh, but it's very, very close. Uh, I think we've got about $1.17 on, on the low band and maybe like a dollar on the mid band. Uh, so, you know, it's possible that that number, they're, they're contracting and they, at some point they'll become level. But I think in the future you may actually see an inversion uh, in the private market. Um, you know, one of the things that, uh, that, that you don't see in the, um, uh, in the private market is much information. Uh, a lot of it's done privately. They don't give you information about individual market levels numbers. They just throw out a big number uh, that you have to hunt and dig for. And uh, you know, folks like uh, Brian at, at AllNet are, are very good about you know, deconstructing that amount. And so I think at some level it will be possible uh, to keep an analysis uh, open on this and find out where things are going uh, as far as auction prices and as far as uh, the individual market transactions. Uh, but yeah, I want to talk about the high band and probably take a look at millimeter wave at some point in the future. Uh, but that really wasn't what I ended up looking at here. All right, questions? Ruben, I got one question for you. And each of the carriers built up their spectrum positions over time, and I don't really want to get into that. But uh, the one question you did demonstrate was some of the past cowboys and bankruptcies. And if you look at the current cowboys that's out there, Charlie Ergen and Dish, his participation in the last couple of auctions because he doesn't have a network. Uh, but I was curious to get any thoughts on that. I think there is, uh, to some uh, you know, aspect, the more bidders. I think what we see is the higher number of bidders that there are uh, in the auctions, uh, the more likely prices are going to go up. We also have uh, you know situation where they bought licenses, similar licenses, the mid-band licenses, for a uh, you know, what now looks like a steal, 50 cents. Um, you know, a couple of years later, at and ended up spending two bucks on that same type of mid-band. So there is, uh, you know, some benefits in, in having cowboys in the market, but I also think, uh, you know, overall, there is, uh, there's, there's certainly an importance of getting the right people involved in building the right network and whether he's going to be working towards something, you know, eventually that, uh, that, that bill will come due. You know, he has to, um, he has to fish or cut bait. And, uh, you know, I don't know where that leads. I think it probably leads to a sale of Dish or, or the entire Spectrum Holdings, but I really don't think he's going to build himself. But that's what businessmen do. Give a two-minute overview of the advantages of any 
kind of talked about one band and but this band and my band just really quickly and isn't there like a a real advantage to having the combination of all three of them? Absolutely. Um, well, so to kind of give the overview, the low band um, being, you know, the predominant uh, early adoption, um, you know, we wanted to get the spectrum out to everybody and the carriers uh, found a great way to do that by building these giant, you know, uh, cell sites and blasting the uh, very high energy waves out to people uh, to get that. And what they eventually found was that, well, the, the low band, uh, could also do that. They weren't as powerful, but you know they could do the job as far as getting coverage. You just had to put more and then more locations. And then over time, um, you know they started discovering. Well, we need to add more and more capacity to get more and more uh, of the radio frequency waves to the end users. And that eventually came a uh, into you know the realization that we need to get the more and more uh, more and more radios, closer and closer uh, to the uh, individual users. And it's got that multiplicative effect that, you know, you can spend less on spectrum, but, but you have to make up for it by buying more cell sites and more, uh, you know, base station equipment. So, you know, I think uh, in a larger sense, you kind of have to look at it as like a single flat line where, you know, some of that spend is going to be spectrum and then some of that spend is going to be on the uh, electronics. And so that number may shift, you know, that percentage may shift over, you know, whatever you're looking at for as far as low band versus mid band versus high band, but you're still spending X amount of dollars. Um, and, and the second half of your question, you refresh me. So the difference between, I mean, so there's an advantage to mid band, there's an advantage to low band, there's an advantage to mid band, I'm assuming, and I'm guessing there's an advantage to high band. In some way, and then having all three of those. The, the advantage of high band is. The advantage of the high band is going to be you have more bandwidth. So, we, we talked a lot about that 10 megahertz bandwidth. Uh, for the high band, it's not 10 megahertz, it's a lot more than that. And so, that 10 megahertz really is a. Uh, that's the capacity that you end up having to deal with getting that information back and forth. And then, so those high, uh, high band um, licenses. You have this much capacity. You have 100 megahertz. I mean, you potentially have 500 megahertz. I mean, you know, you can imagine like that huge pipe being able to transmit. How much information can go back and forth? Uh, now, it can't go very far, which means you have to get very close to the customer. Hence, the small cells uh, and and the DAS equipment. Really nice,